Father, we just thank you that you are a God who, uh, though you sit high, you look low. And that you are a God who, um, in spite of the challenges and the difficulties, you never leave us. You are with us every step of the way. And for that, God, we are thankful. And, and it's, it's, it's easy at times to lose perspective and to not have gratitude, to not just find a way to be thankful in the midst of a situation. But God, Lord, in this moment, we just want to turn our eyes upon Jesus and just thank you for all of your many blessings. Whether we feel like they are so common, like waking us up this morning or getting us here safely to the more complex, keeping us safe on the highway and, and providing for our families. God, you are good all of the time and all of the time you are good. So in this moment, Lord, our prayer is that you would just continue to help us to have a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation of who you are and what you are wanting to do in our lives that those who are in the building and those who are online, that today we would just have a, a spirit of surrender, that we would surrender the need to perform, that we would surrender the need to be perfect, that we would surrender the need to have it all together, to never make a mistake, and that we would recognize that we are indeed your children and that you would be glorified in our walk with you. So, Lord, would you just draw close to us? Would you open our hearts as we open your word? And would you speak to us? We thank you for hearing and answering in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. 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 Super excited about um, today's message. And I'm grateful for, again, the opportunity to stand before you. I don't take this moment or this opportunity for granted. Um, nor do I, I don't take it for granted, nor do I, nor, nor do I want to ever um, mismanage this moment. The fact that you are here and you are giving um, our church a portion of your attention, um, I'm just so grateful for that. And I am aware that, you know, your weeks have been highs and lows, and that my burden in this moment is to really just help us to have a better understanding of what God wants to do in and through us, through the highs and lows. Do you, has anyone felt this week or in the weeks past that you have just been on the rat race of life? Do I have a witness? I got one in the back, two, three. Um, you know, that rat race where it feels like uh, you are just on that hamster wheel and it is just running, 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 running. I, I felt that way. Um, as, as recent as yesterday, I felt that way. My wife had to work and praise God that she has a job. Amen. Somebody, amen. I'll say amen for myself. Amen. Um, my wife had to work and, um, you know, our daughters are out of school. Amen. That they're alive and well. Amen. And, uh, I'm trying to give thanks in all things, y'all. <laughs> Just, I'm trying to find the silver lining. And, uh, so my wife had to work and my daughters are out of school. So they're at home. And uh, our, the young lady that we use who watches us, who helps us watch our kids during the day, um, she had a conflict, so she couldn't come in. Praise God that she's doing well uh, and that she, all is well in her life. And so I had our daughters all day, which is a blessing, um, I, which is a blessing if you don't have to preach the next day. Yeah, yeah. It's a blessing if you don't have work to get done, right? If you can just be on vacation and take the time, but trying to manage them. And we also um, have a wedding coming up this week. And so trying to also have family who's coming in. My parents flew in um, yesterday. And so I'm trying to get the house cleaned up and clean up bathrooms and make beds and do dishes and, you know, just all of that good stuff to prepare, prepare the house uh, from when my parents come. And so I'm on one hand, I'm juggling over here trying to keep my, my daughters from killing themselves, literally killing themselves. On the other hand, I'm trying to clean the house. On the other hand, I'm trying to write a sermon at the same time, right? And then I got this 
stupid idea of like writing this book for someone. Someone asked me to write a book for them and it was due like two years ago. And every week they send me a text message, hey, is it done yet? And I'm like, no, it'll be done when it gets done. But I, I have this burden of like, man, I have to finish. And I'm like 99.9% .9 done, but it's just getting over that hump. And so I'm also trying to finish that because they gave me one last deadline of June 9th. They said, I have to have it by June 9th. I said, fine, you'll have it by June 9th. And so I have that that I'm trying to juggle. And then I, have, I don't know why I signed up for this stupid class. I just have this class I have to take. And, you know, it's two weeks in. I haven't done any of the work yet. So I'm thinking about that. And so I'm just like, man, I'm just trying to get all of these things done and that's just my life I'm sure yours is either similar or it's very you know just as bad where you're trying to juggle multiple things at the same time does anyone in here uh, empathize with me at all yes all of us like like you have multiple things that you're trying to juggle and if you're not careful if you're not careful you will experience this thing that we call burnout touch your neighbor and say burnout burnout has anyone ever experienced burnout before yeah, it's just an emotional, burnout is, is, is an emotional exhaustion where you are just, your soul is tired and you just feel like I cannot do it anymore. Uh, uh, there is this point, that, and I mean, there's like emotional burnout, but then there's also mental burnout. Have you ever experienced mental burnout where it's like your brain just hurts? Like it's, you don't have a headache per se, but it's just like my brain just, I'm tired of thinking, right? My brain just hurts. And then emotional burnout and mental burnout are compounded upon by physical burnout where you're just tired and you're getting, I'm getting older and my hamstrings hurting and I'm the back of my knee. Like Paul, I got this pain in the back of my knee and I'm icing my shoulder every single night and it's just like my body is breaking down in front of me Sarah I need a massage therapist and some yoga in my life um, and so all of these things are happening and I'm saying to myself God how why is this is this what you created us for to burn out to crash and burn where we are trying to keep up and there is very little rhythm say rhythm very little rhythm in our our lives. I don't believe that that is how or why we were created. I believe God created us to experience balance, say balance, to experience an equilibrium in our lives where things are flowing and we are experiencing peace and joy and rest and, and tranquility. And yet at the same time, we are also experiencing the ability to make things and produce and to provide for our families. I believe that God has called us and created us to live a life where we are marching to a beat that is different than the beat that, the, that this world is trying to play for us. Because if we follow the beat of this world, it will have you literally running like a chicken with its head cut off. I know it's kind of a bad analogy, but you all get the point. Where what we're doing makes absolute, absolutely no sense, but we are just running, running, running all the time. I, at the end of the day, towards the end of the day, I started getting frustrated with myself. And when you get frustrated, anyone in the house ever try to choose someone to express their frustrations on? Right. Like like um, I wouldn't be in this situation if you weren't doing this. Right. I try to try to point fingers at someone. So the Lord, you know, the Lord, I'm not a perfect husband. So I I, I, I put my targets on my wife. But she's at work. Remember, I told you all she's at work. <laughs> so I can't actually you can't call her. She's a nurse. I can't call her. But it's like just inside. I'm just like, man, if she wasn't at work right now, I wouldn't be able, I would be, have, be able to do all. Da, 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 da. And so like I'm having like an internal argument with her while she's at work <laughs> by myself. Right. In the midst of that, in the midst of that argue, arguing with my wife in my mind, um, the Lord said, man, aren't you just grateful that your wife has a job? Aren't you just grateful that, you know, you know, you all are your, your needs are met and your bills are paid and you got a little money in the bank? Aren't you just grateful that, you know, you have family that's coming in that loves you and supports you? And it was like in the have you ever had an argument with yourself and then in the middle of the argument, God speaks to you and you, you want him to stop speaking because you really want to be upset and you want to be mad, but when he's speaking to you, you can't be mad. All you can do is surrender. Has that ever happened to anyone, right? And so I'm, and so I'm at that point where I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to surrender this thing. Thank you, God. I'm going to give thanks. I'm going to enter into your courts with thanksgiving and into your gates with praise. 
Thank you, Lord, for all of the things that you have done for me. Do I got a witness in the house? As I was thinking about this and wrestling with this yesterday specifically, but all throughout the week, I began to realize that in our lives that God has essentially given us three things that he has called us to do amongst others. There are three things that God has called us to do. And I want to try to illustrate these three with you, Stephen. I don't know if you can jump down for me real quick and if you can just hand me, Stephen, these, 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 uh, the smaller ones there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, here comes Paul. Paul will help me. Just the three smaller ones. The three, no, no, yeah, three smaller ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> there are three things, essentially, that God, that God has called us, that God has called us to do. Can you see this all right? Thank you. <clears throat> the first thing, the first thing that God has called us to do, men and women alike, the first thing, what does that say? The first thing he's called us to do is produce. That if you're alive, And if you're breathing, man or woman, that God, when he created us, he created us to be producers at our core. Another way of saying this might be a a provider, to provide for your family, to provide for your children, to take care of your responsibilities. In fact, this is embedded in Genesis in chapter 1 in verse 28. Jesus is, God is creating Adam and Eve. And then he, he looks down in verse, in verse 28 of Genesis 1. It says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and what? Multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Like in this text, this is like our marching orders. Before sin stepped in and before we had all of this foolishness in the world, God said, I'm creating you to be producers. I want you to be fruitful and I want you to multiply. I want you to do something. All of us in here have the gift and have the ability, and it's not just the gift and ability, but all of us have a God-ordained, God-given mandate to produce. That none of us should ever think to ourselves that I can't do something or I don't have enough. No, everything that you need, God has put within your grasp. Everything that you need, everything that God, that you need in life, everything that God desires for you to do, he has said, listen, I have called you to be producers. In fact, the, the fact that we're sitting in this building and we're sitting on these pews and I'm, we're looking at these cameras and I'm holding this mic or you're at your home, it's because someone was a producer. Someone out there took seriously this call upon our life, which was to produce. And as a result, we drive the cars that we drive. We live in the homes that we live in. We wear the clothes that we, li- we wear. We, we have access to technology and phones and computers because someone, whether they are a believer or not, they understood fundamentally that there is something in me that I want to contribute to the world. I want to add value to the world. And that value I add to the world will also be repaid to me in monetary value. Amen, somebody. And so we have jobs. In fact, Paul says in 2 2 Thessalonians, he says, listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. Has your mama ever told you that or your daddy ever told you that? Like, Like, if you don't work, you don't eat. Like, there is no place in the body of Christ for believers who are lazy. If you are a believer... If you are someone who believes in God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and you've accepted Christ your Savior, you understand that a part of your identity as a child of God is to have a job. Say amen, somebody. To have a job and to produce. Now, don't don't get me wrong, right? Because there's different types of jobs. So I'm not talking about everything has to be six figures or you have to be punching the clock. No, you might say, you know what? In this season of my life, my job is to be a homemaker, right? And I'm producing something in my children, Right? Or my job during this season of my life is to take care of my family. My job during this season of my life is to, is to raise my kids and I'm homeschooling. So I don't want you to think that you have to work for the man. Y'all know who the man is? Anybody in here know who the man is? Have y'all ever heard that phrase before? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not saying you have to work for the man, right? That you got to go punch the clock and put in eight hours, nine hours, right? But what I am saying is we just can't be sitting around the house playing video games, I can't be watching the uh, sports center 24 hours a day. I can't be watching The View and then what comes on after The View? Uh, I don't even know. Uh, uh, General Hospital and then what comes after General Hospital? Is that even on still? Uh, What's the other one that used to be on? Uh, Days of Our Lives, right? If I go from The View to General Hospital to Days of Our Lives, something is wrong. 
right? And then I jump on YouTube and I got all type of stuff. No, 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 no. God has called us to produce, to provide, to create something. Say something. Now, what that something is will be unique to you based off of your gifts, based off of your abilities, based off of your passions. But whatever it is that you're creating, it should add either value to your family or some type of monetary value to yourself. You've got, you've got bills to be paid, right? So fundamentally, God has called us to produce. But he has also called us, what does that say? To serve. He's also called us to serve. Serving is something that I do in response to my relationship with God. So because, because I serve a God, because I'm, I believe in a God who willingly gave his son for me and he has come down, he has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in high places, I now understand it is my privilege to serve the body of Christ, to serve my community. And I'm not doing it because I want some type of monetary value returned to me. I'm not doing it because I'm looking for a paycheck. I'm not doing it because I'm somehow hoping that if I give for you, you're going to give back to me. No, I'm doing it out of the goodness and out of the overflow of my heart. Now, all of us have fully embraced this idea that we need a job. That's why we go to school from K through 12 and then, then, then our undergrad and our master's and sometimes even a, a, a graduate degree. And so we understand we need to get a job. But many of us don't understand that in addition to our job, God has also called us to use the gifts and the influence and the time that he has given us to add value to the kingdom of heaven. That I can't just be a producer and add value to my family. I recognize that I am a citizen of a broader community called the kingdom of heaven. Say the kingdom of heaven. As a, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, God has called me to serve the body of Christ. What does that look like? Well, John chapter 13. I'm not going to read the whole text for you, but here Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. And his disciples their mind is blown because they're like, you are the master. You're the teacher. How is it that you're washing our feet? And I just want to read for you. He says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again, sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? Verse 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. What is he saying? He's saying, as, as I have served you, turn around and serve others. Don't ask for anything in return. Don't look for a stipend. Don't look for a check. Don't do it because you want a pat on the back. You do it simply because I have done it for you. And in your life, I mean, we see this all throughout the word of God. Mark chapter 9, he sat down, called the 12 disciples over to him, and he said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone. Matthew 25, one of the more popular texts where he, where he tells the story of how he separates the sheep from the goats. And he says, listen, you know, when I was poor, blind, naked, in prison, hungry, you ministered to me. And the, and the, and the, and the sheep are like, Lord, when did we do this? And in Matthew 25 and in verse, in verse 40, he says, whatever you've done to the least of these, you have done it unto myself. It is this idea that God is saying that, yes, um, you have to produce and you have to provide financially for your family, but you also have a gift. And I want to be very clear in the house of God. Every single one of us in the house of God has a gift. Now, I think church has done a disservice to the body of Christ in general, because when you see gifts, when you think of gifts, you think the pastor who's speaking has a gift. Amber and Mary and Olga who sang have a gift. Right? Stephen, who's on the camera, has a gift. Paula, who just loves everybody, has a gift, but I don't have no gift. Because you don't see yourself either preaching or singing or, or doing Bible study, so therefore you don't have a gift. But I want to let you know that the devil is a lie. God has given every single one of us in here a gift that he wants us to use to build up the body of Christ. 
to build up this, this congregation and this community. So, so you should know right off the jump what your productivity looks like. You work for AT&T, Anthem, you work for Spectrum, you work for a construction company, you work for a hospital, you work for Wendy's, McDonald's, you have a job. Or maybe you're an entrepreneur, you're self-employed, you have a job. What does your service look like? How, what does your service look like? How much of your week is given to AT&T and to the man, and how much of your week is given to the kingdom of heaven, to serving? For many of us, this is in our service. For many of us, this is our service. And for many of us, our service is confined to Saturday morning from 11.15, you might come a little early at 11, to 12.30. You need me to hand out something? I got you. You need me to stack some chairs? I got you. Right? You need me to, to help break down some cameras? I got you. We spend most of our time producing and very little of our time serving. And, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, what, what many of us have done is, is, is serving is really not even in the equation. For most of us, JB, can you, hand me, can you come over on this side for me and hand me that, that medium-sized one? For most of us, it's not serving. For most of us, it is, what does that say? Consuming. So we go to work, and we'll work a good job and provide for our family, but all of our discretionary time is spent consuming. What is consuming? Give me an example. You're eating, eating all the food. What else is consuming? Taking something. What else is consuming? What's that? Entertainment consuming, right? How many, any of y'all woken up and the first thing y'all do is go on your phone? Y'all doing this thing right here? You see this, you see this action right here? You see this? Just hold your hand up and go like this. Some of y'all real good at it. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? right? Y'all just scrolling, 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 scrolling. What, is it when, what are you doing when you're scrolling? You're not producing. Come on now. And you're not serving. What are you doing? You're consuming. You're consuming something that someone else has produced. So someone else produced Instagram, and what are you doing? Because someone else produced Twitter, and what are you doing? Someone else produced a news article or some CNN or some Fox article, and what are you doing? Consuming, right? So someone else started a business, started a restaurant, started a food chain, and what are you doing when you go there and you eat? Right? You're, you're consuming. And consuming is not altogether bad, but consuming should really be about that size. Not this size. We produce, we consume. And yet, serving for many of us is nowhere in the equation. And what I'm saying is, if most of your life is spent producing and then consuming, your life is out of balance. Because while God did create you to be a producer, he did not create you to be a consumer. While God did create you to be a producer, he did not create you to be a consumer. Because a consumer implies that I am not giving anything back. I am just taking. Think about the, the plants, right? I think that's the perfect example, right? Uh, a plant will take in what? CO2, and it gives off what? Oxygen, right? I think that's the perfect example of how God has created us. That while, yes, the plant does take in, it does consume CO2, it takes this CO2 in so that it can produce something that will add value to someone else. 
So that if you are a consumer, you're a consumer purely because you recognize me consuming this will help me produce something that will add value to my family. Or me consuming this will help me um, um, produce something that will serve the body of Christ. Are y'all with me in this place? So when we think about the devil's attempt in our lives, it is to get us out of balance. And I believe that the devil is a sumo wrestler. Anybody here ever watch sumo wrestling? Yeah, you know, I was doing some research this week on sumo wrestlers. Man, these are some massive brothers, right? I mean, uh, on the, the average weight is between three, 400 pounds, but they had this one brother, I, forget, I can't pronounce his name, but he got up to 600 pounds, right? A 600 pound, and I would ask JB to come up here and sumo wrestle with me, but it's not the time nor the place, maybe afterwards, but uh, next time, next time. But, but the whole, and, and, and the whole idea behind sumo wrestling is that you want to use your weight to somehow lift the other person and to get them off balance so that if you get them off balance, you will be a lot more able to push them out of bounds. And I just believe that the devil is a sumo wrestler because he recognizes that if I can get you off balance, I can push you out of bounds. Out of bounds. Out of bounds is where burnout is. Out of bounds is where suicide is. Out of bounds is where you throw in the towel is. Out of bounds is where you say, you know what, I'm to hell in the handbasket with this. I can't do it anymore. Out of bounds is when you are so emotionally and psychologically and spiritually depleted that you have nothing to give and you throw in the towel. Out of bounds is where anxiety is. Out of bounds is where depression is. Out of bounds is where mental illness is. And he knows if I can get your life out of balance, I know I can get you out of bounds. And so when I think about what God has called us to do, I'm saying to myself, as I was reflecting on the work I was doing yesterday and all this week, I'm saying, man, God has called me to produce, but God has also called me to serve. For many of us, we take very seriously God's calling upon our life to produce. And for many of us, we take it so seriously that our producing doesn't look like this. Help me me with that one, JB. Our producing, hold it up now, it's heavy. Our producing looks like this. So we will spend, anybody ever work 60 hours? Yeah, 70 hours, 80 hours? We will spend, yeah, I got a witness back there. We will spend so much time producing that what's, what's crazy about this is that there is not, there is not, um, <laughs> we don't have unlimited containers. <laughs> There's not unlimited container in your life. Because we, when, your, when your production goes to this level, everything else goes to this level. Like you can't think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend 80 hours producing and then somehow I'm just gonna be able to also serve, or somehow I'm gonna be also do other things. No, 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 no. Like if this is if this is how your production and your productivity is, if it's consuming the lion's share of your life, it will leave no room for anything else. It won't leave room for family. It won't leave room for the kingdom. It won't leave room for any type of your own personal professional development. It won't leave room for your own personal exercise, mental exercise, spiritual exercise, physical exercise. You will produce yourself out of bounds. Because there is a third area that God wants us to embrace as his children. And that third area is what I like to call, I'm trying to make some room on this table here. That third area is what I like to call Rest. Rest. God has called us to produce. And most of us, our life looks like this. He's called us to serve. Most of us looks like this. He has also called us to rest. He's called us to rest mentally, emotionally. In fact, I love, you know, when you think about the Bible, 
the Bible is a record, specifically the New Testament, Genesis, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's a record of Jesus' life here on earth. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what blows my mind is that they actually recorded Jesus' rest. Like you would think they would just record the most important aspects of his life. Raising Lazarus from the dead, you know, forgiving the woman who was caught in, the, the, in adultery, you know, feeding the 5,000. Like that's important stuff. But they also record his rest. I mean, if you look through Mark, Mark, Mark says it best in Mark chapter 6, not Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 1, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out into an isolated place to pray. And Mark is trying to communicate, like, listen, Jesus did not burn, like, both ends of the candlestick. But he had margin. He took time to get away and to rest. In fact, there was a, there was a text where um, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's like, listen, let's, let's come and let's just, let's get away for a while. Like the crowds are pushing on us. There's so much productivity. He's saying, let's just get away and let's just rest. Now, rest is physical. Amen. Eight hours. Do I got a witness in the house? Eight hours. But rest is also spiritual. Right? It's spiritual. Now, sometimes we try to do two at one things. We want physical and spiritual rest at the same time. So we come to church and we sleep. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your neighbor. <laughs> I'm going to get my physical rest and my spiritual rest at the same time. Right? It's called double dipping. Right? That's not quite how it works. What God has called us to do is to experience spiritual, physical, emotional rest. Sometimes you have to hit the pause button. Sometimes you have to get off, take an exit, and pull up to a rest stop. You just can't keep driving. You can't keep trying to produce all of the time. Because your productivity, and I don't even like this one. This one's too big. Let's take this one off. Your productivity is directly connected to your rest. Studies have shown it. Research has proven it. The reason why the Lakers lost... <laughs> They didn't rest. Facts. Turn to your neighbor and say facts. They had the shortest off season. It was like, what, 70 days? From the time they won the championship to the time they started the new season, they had no rest. Whereas the Clippers, they, they had a whole off season. Warriors too. All these teams. Warriors had more time than anybody. Your productivity is directly connected to, to rest. Some of us, if you don't like the word rest, then let me use another word, recovery. Recovery. I, I've been, I, you know, someone on our staff who, who, will, not, who will not be named um, called Paula, she said to me, she said, Pastor, I saw a before and after picture of you. Uh, it wasn't like one of those glamorous before and after pictures. It was like the before looked better than the after. <laughs> she saw before and after where the before looked better than the after. And she said, I saw, I saw, you know, how Facebook will pull up one of those, you know, highlights of like a year ago, two years ago, this is where you were. And she's like, yeah, they, they, they pulled up a highlight of where you were, you know, two, three years ago. And I was like, man, who was that? She had to do a double take and she realized that was me because I looked better then than I, listen, y'all not, y'all not praying for me. My staff, my staff is brutal, y'all. They... So, 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 so she said that to me. I said, man, I got to get myself together. And so I said, you know, I'm going to start working out. I got start wearing my Apple Watch and start exercising and going to the gym and, you know, running more. And I'm that OCD type of person, Stephen, where if I commit to doing something, I'm going like all in, right? So I'm not just going to work out like three days a week. I'm doing two a days. Like that's just how my mind works. Like I'm going to catch a 5.30 a.m. workout, and I'm going to do like a 6 p.m. workout. Like, like, that's just how my mind works. And so I've been going hard trying to get myself together and get myself in shape. And, and I'm beginning to realize that, that while that might be good on paper, it doesn't work for my body. Because my body's like, Seth, we need some rest. We need some recovery. My hamstring is hurting right now as I stand before you. Because my body's like, we need some recovery. So, so God has given us 
these things that he wants us to engage in. He wants us consistently to produce. He wants us consistently to rest. And he wants us consistently to serve. Take a minute right now. Play some minute music for them. I don't know, something upbeat. Take a minute right now. Some of that upbeat jazz or something. I don't know. And just evaluate your life. I'm being serious. Just evaluate your life. Just a minute, right? This is not the end. We're almost done. But evaluate. How much of your week, something a little more upbeat than that. Uh, how much of your week is producing? How much of your week is resting? And how much of your week is serving? Take a minute. Think about the last activities you engaged in this week. What bucket do they go in? I had to take my daughters to gymnastics. Was that producing? Was that resting? Was that serving? I had to write a couple sermons. Was that producing? Was that resting? Was that serving? I had to clean the house. Was that producing? Was that resting? Was that serving? had to go to the grocery store. Was that producing? Was that resting? Was that serving? It can't all be serving. Think about your life and think about how am I balanced? Thank you. How, How am I balanced? How am I experiencing healthy rhythms? Because what inevitably is going to happen is if your producing gets big, inevitably your, ser- your resting gets small. And if your producing gets super big, then your serving gets small. Is this how your life looks? Where you are spending so much time producing on the job, producing for your family, being productive, being a provider, doing all those things, that that you are crashing at the end of the day, that you are crashing at the end of the week, and that there is very little, if any, opportunity to actually add value to the body of Christ to serve. If, if this is how, your, if this is how your, your, your week looks, I want to say something with all reverence and respect. If this is how your week looks, you need to get a different job. Hear me now. If this is how your week looks, you need to get a different job. Now, There's somebody out there who your week looks like this. If this is how your week looks, you need to get a job. (laughs) This is not in balance either. Too much rest. The the, the wisest man, whoever whoever said, he said, uh, Solomon said, a little folding of the hands and a little, uh, he said, what does he say? A little folding of the hands and a little drifting of the eyes. And he says, and poverty suddenly takes hold of you. That this is not what God intended. That what God designed for you is that your life would be in balance. And that whatever I do on a weekly basis, there is balance. And this thing right here 
called consuming. Where does this go? I consume to produce. Sorry. I consume to produce. The reason I consume is because I need this, I need this food because it'll help me produce. I need this entertainment or entertainment, you might say, might be a part of your mental rest, which is fine, right? But what you're saying is I'm, I'm consuming something because consuming something is going to help me become a better producer. When you think about serving, there are opportunities all around you. Because I think most of us, we got the producing down. And I think a good number of us, we probably got the resting down. But for many of us, we don't have the serving down. For many of us, church is not about serving. Church is about consuming. So I come here to consume a message, to consume praise and worship, to, to, to connect with my friends and family, and then I go about the rest of my weekend. And what I want to challenge you to do is to not view what you do on Saturday morning as consuming. I want you to view what you do on Saturday morning as serving. So when you come into this building, and I'm talking to believers, you come into this building, you say, how can I serve? Because this is a part of why I was created. When you're going throughout your week, you say to yourself, not just how can I serve, but who can I serve? It may not be in the structure of an organization like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or Habitat for Humanity, or some type of outreach initiative. You might not be working a camera or, you know, playing an instrument or helping set up or tear down, but you might say, you know what? There's someone at my job that God has called me to serve. There's someone in my community that God has called me to serve. There's an opportunity in my world, in my radius, that God is calling me to serve. I was upset with my wife most of yesterday, arguing Janet in my mind with her. It was a good argument, I was winning. She came home late last night around midnight. She gets off at 11, 11.30, she got home around midnight. And uh, normally I'm already asleep by then. So I woke up this morning around 5.36 and we started having a conversation around 6.30 laying in bed. And I asked her, I said, how, how was your night? Now, by this time, the Lord had already rebuked me. The Lord had already rebuked me for, my, for being a selfish husband. Uh, and I asked her, how was your night? And she said, man, it was crazy. She said, I, was try I tried to leave early. I tried to leave around 10 because all the patients were done, all the patients were cleared, and I was trying to leave early. But then one of my coworkers, when I t went to tell her I was leaving, she just broke down and started crying. And she started telling me all about the things that are going on in her life, and I just sat there and I listened. And then she says, and then earlier that day, another coworker, um, I went back to the break room, and another coworker, young lady, came up to me, she says, can I have a hug? And my wife was like, okay. And she gave her a hug and she started telling her about all this drama that's happening in her life. And as I was laying there, JB, this morning, you know, 6.30 this morning, listening to her tell me these stories, I, I said to myself, I thought I needed her yesterday at home. But the Lord had need of her at work. That while she was at work, producing, the Lord also had her on assignment serving. As much as I would want each one of you all to, after the sermon, to come up to me and say, Pastor, sign me up. Where do you need help? How can I, how can I help out? I'll, you know, next Saturday, I'll be there at you know, 5 a.m. to help you guys do whatever you want to do. As much as I would like every one of you all to come up to me and say that. As much as I would like every single one of you all to come up and say that to me. I recognize that serving is bigger than what we do on Saturday morning. But that while you are producing on your job Monday through Friday, 
nine to five, God is also calling you to have a level of awareness because there are people that he wants you to serve. You won't get a bonus for serving them. You won't get a raise for serving them. You probably won't even get a pat on the back for serving them. But God is saying, I am calling you to serve. And so my heart desire and the reason why I'm sharing this message with you today is because I want you to honestly take a hard look at your life and evaluate the size of your buckets. Now, I'm not so naive to think that you're always going to experience balance. I'm aware of the rhythms of life. Sometimes producing might feel like this. And then sometimes you might say, I'm going on a two-week vacation and I ain't doing nothing. And your rest will be like this. I recognize that there are ebbs and flows and there are seasons to our life. And that you might say, hey, for the next two weeks, I'm locked in on my job. I got a big project I got to get done. I don't have any time, other time or anything else. And I get that. But you say, but after those two weeks, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm vegging out with my family. And we just going to spend time connecting and walking and and loving each other and resting. Or you might say, you know what? This, this year for our, for our vacation, we're gonna go on a mission trip and we're gonna go serve somewhere. And while we're resting, we're also gonna be serving. I recognize that there are ebbs and flows, but what I want to appeal to you is that your life maintains some, some level of balance and fluidity, that you're not so lopsided that all you're doing is working and getting a little bit of rest and very little serving. Because when Christ comes again, as we believe he's coming soon, he's gonna ask you six questions. And one of them is not how much money did you make? That's not on the list. He's not gonna ask you how big was your retirement? He's not gonna ask you how big was your house? How far up the ladder did you climb? That's not on the list. What's the only thing on the list is, when I was naked, did you feed, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was a stranger, did you take me in? When I was sick, did you come visit me? This is the only thing on the list. Whatever you did to the least of these, you did it to me. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, life has a way of compelling us, calling us, uh, pressuring us to perform, to run, to do more, be more, have more, make more. And we will do it at the expense of our family. We will do it at the expense of our health. We will do it at the expense of our spiritual health, mental health, physical health. But God, in this moment right now, we want to acknowledge that you have a different way that you want your people to live. You want us to live with rest, with producing, and with serving. God, you know the areas of our hearts individually. And my prayer is that we would all make a decision to find balance to make sure that we're not running so hard on this this hamster wheel that we're burning out. God, this is our prayer. You know, I want to share a story with you. Um, There was a, a child, like one of these kids running around, not quite that young. There was a kid who one day walked up to his dad and he said, dad, how much, how much do you make an hour? And the dad was like, 
why are you asking me how much money I make an hour? Dad was a little upset, right? This was a 10-year-old kid. What do you mean, how much do I make an hour? He's like, well, I'm just, I'm just curious. How much do you make an hour? The dad had a good job. Dad said, well, on average, I probably make around $200 an hour. The son said, wow, $200 an hour, $200 an hour that's, that's a lot of money. The son then said, dad, do you mind if I borrow $100? He said, what do you want? What do you, for what? So you can go buy a toy? He's like, another video game? He's like, no, I'm not giving you $100. Like, get out of here. So the son walked away. And he went to his room. And, and after a while, the, the father started thinking, like, man, why was my response so harsh? Like, maybe he didn't want to buy a video game. He's like, okay. So he went to his son's room, and he said, you know, I may have been a little bit harsh. What do you want the money for? You know, what, what do you want? He's like, ah, oh, just there's something I want, to, I want to get. I just don't know if I can borrow $100. He said, but I promise I'll give it back to you. His dad said, okay, fine, I'll give you $100. So he went into his wallet, pulled out $100, handed it to the kid. The kid was so excited. He took the $100, and when he went back to his room, his dad was with him, he went into his piggy bank, and he pulled out another $100, $200, and he handed it to his dad. And he said, dad, I want to buy an hour of your time. And the father obviously was sobered immediately because he, like many of us, realized that we spend so much of our time working, 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 that the most important thing to us, our family, our health, our relationship with God, our relationship with our friends, gets put on the back burner. And if you've ever asked a man or a woman on their deathbed if they have any regrets, nine times out of ten, they will all say, I wish I spent more time with my family. None of them will say, I wish I got that job. (laughs) Or I wish I made the promotion. Or I wish I worked more hours. Or I wish I got the contract. They will all say, I wish I spent more time with my family. Had better relationships. I want to share something with you that my wife and I have made a decision about concerning my own life and my own balance. And that is for the last almost 15 years, I have been producing, 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 preaching, 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 working, working, working. I don't know the last time. Well, let me say it like this. I have never gone on a family vacation with my wife and my daughters. And the last vacation my wife and I went on, it was a church-sponsored workshop that we were going to. And so we were going to learn something to a workshop, and so I took her with me, and we doubled that up as a little getaway for the two of us while we were at this workshop for a few days. And I have begun to experience the devil because my life for so long has been out of balance that the devil has begun to knock me out of bounds out of bounds with stress and anxiety and just frustration and feeling like I am unable to give my best to my family to my church to my community so my wife and I have decided through the blessing of this church board and through the conference administration it has been approved that I'm going to take some time to rest It's what we call a sabbatical. It's a Sabbath for an extended period of time. That beginning on July 1st, that myself and my family, we will be checking out mentally from my responsibilities as pastor of Relove. And we will be spending that time for three months just in recovery. Spiritual recovery, mental recovery, emotional recovery. Now, I'm fortunate to be in a position with my job where I can engage in three months off. Professors and academics also are familiar with sabbaticals when they are given time to advance and pursue additional research. But our conference has just made it a priority. The Southeastern California Conference has made it a priority to also give pastors that similar opportunity just to experience spiritual renewal. It depends on how long you've been in ministry. So you can't start ministry on day one and then say, I want to take three months off. It doesn't work like that. 
You have to have been in ministry at least seven years in this conference. I've been in ministry 15 years and have not taken advantage of that benefit that they've made available to us. And so beginning July 1st, um, this church will be, be run by a very competent and very dynamic team of individuals from Jeremiah, Paula, and Stephen, our church board, Eleanor Rodriguez is, is one of our core elders who will be handling a lot of the, the responsibility of issues that might arise. And I know that this church will definitely be in good hands. There will be a dynamic preaching rotation, um, so you will not miss a thing. I don't want anyone in the house to feel like, well, since the pastor's taken off, I'm going to take off too. And I'll see... <laughs> They're going to say, I'll see y'all in three months. We want to encourage you to still come, to still engage. Um, We have several individuals from within our conference who will be coming. Um, Pastor Marquise Johns will be doing a a three-week series here in July. Um, We have several dynamic speakers from around our Southern California area who will be coming in and will be holding down this pulpit. And you will not feel a lack of of a solid word, right? The word will be preached. And if you're open to it, I know it will add value to your life. My hope and my prayer is that when I return, um, beginning the 1st of October, that you all will still be here. Amen. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, I'll still be here. Some of y'all don't look convinced, right? You'll still be here, um, but that there will be more of you as the church is opening, the community is opening, and that more people will be coming back. Also, I want to let you know that we have some things planned for the end of the year. I have been in conversations with the conference about doing some evangelism um, around the Thanksgiving season. And that's something that I'm excited to share with you in more detail as we approach that time. But we're not going to take our foot off the gas, right? We're going to continue to press forward. But in order for us to do this successfully together, we have to do it together. That in this church, we need more servants, more producers, and less consumers. The consumer for a church is that person who doesn't know Christ or who is trying to evaluate whether or not they want to serve Christ. That's the consumer. So you have a friend, you have a family member who they're not a believer, you know, or maybe they're a marginal believer, they haven't really been to church, bring them and let them consume, right? But for those of you all who have made a decision that Christ is your Lord and Savior. For those of you all who have made a decision that you want to see Jesus when he comes again in peace, you are not consumers. You are servants. You are producers in the body of Christ. And you serve the Lord. Now, I get it. Sometimes we have a rough week producing and we need to take a rest. So there are some times, and you'll see sometimes JB might be gone, Paula might be gone, or, you know, for example, today, George is not, George's not here, who normally leads out in, in our praise and worship. So we get it that sometimes you want to take a Sabbath, and you just want to say, you know what, I'm just going to get away. And we totally understand that. But I just want to implore you that the success of what God is doing in Orange County through this church, that we're on a dynamic and a wonderful trajectory. And I'm looking forward to what God is going to do but we have to do it together. And so if you are sitting here, listening here today, my appeal to you is that you would make a commitment. Number one, that you would say, you know, I'm going to lean in. During the three months and the pastor's gone, I'm going to lean in and step up. How can I use my gifts? Let me first discover my gifts, and then how can I use my gifts to advance what God wants to do in this place locally? But then number two, my, 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 my appeal is that you would also evaluate the rhythms of your life. And there may be someone right here who needs to take an extended period of rest. Maybe you've been working too hard. Your heart is weak. Your, your bank account's strong, but your heart's weak because you've been working so much. I want to invite you into rest. That rest might look like getting a different job. That rest might look like having a conversation with your family about reprioritizing your time and your, your, your uh, realigning your priorities. But no job is worth your health. Let me say that again. No job is worth 
your health. I'm so thankful, and I know I'm ranting just a little bit right now, so just stay with me. We're almost done. I know I'm so thankful for uh, Naomi, uh, the tennis player, Osaka. Have you heard, followed her story? Who she told the French Open that she wasn't going to do any interviews, and they started fining her $15,000 a pop, and she just decided to withdraw and say, you know what? My mental health is more important than this work. My, she said, my mental health is more important than playing tennis. And she withdrew from the French Open. I don't know if she's a believer or not, but she's teaching us a lesson that no job is worth your mental health. And no job is worth your spiritual health. If you're working Monday through Friday and they call you in on Saturday and you have no time to connect with God, no time to worship corporately with your family, it's not worth it. Because when it's all said and done, God will say to you, you have gained the whole world, but you have lost your soul. What does it profit? And so I would invite you to follow my example and the example of Jesus and say, you know what? Let me find how I can implement a rhythm of rest into my life. And let me make sure that I'm not just gorging on rest and I'm not serving the Lord. How can I serve people? How can I serve my community? How can I serve my church? Because Christ will say, whatever you did to the least of these, you've done it to me. Are you all with me in here? I thank you so much just for this church, for the staff, Paula and Jeremiah and Stephen and Keith and, you know, Mark and Miss Eleanor and all Brandon, the board members, for your support in this decision that I've made. And I'm, I look forward. My intention is to return fully rested and, and ready to go to do the work that God has called us to do here with all the more focus and purpose and success. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you are one who calls us into rest. Your word tells us in Matthew 11, come unto me all ye who are weak and heavy laden and I will give you rest. You say, take my yoke for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you will find rest for your soul. Father, as we go forward into this week, into this weekend, into the rest of this month, this year, may we do so with an awareness of how we are allocating our time. How much of our energy is spent in producing and providing? How much of our time is set aside for just resting? How much of our time is set aside for serving. And may we find a healthy rhythm and a healthy balance and a healthy counterbalance so that the devil will not be able to get us off balance and so that he will not be able to knock us out of bounds, but that we will stay mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually healthy and thriving in Jesus' name. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.